There are certain kinds of writers that come along periodically. They give you pause, make you think, and get you reading articles about things you never expected to find interesting. And yet, in their hands, most subjects do become very interesting. Journalist, memoirist, and travel writer Pico Iyer is one such voice. His new book is called Autumn Light, Season of Fire and Farewells. It's part exploration of Japanese history and culture, part meditation on impermanence and grief. And Pico Iyer joins us now for more. It is a delight to have you back in that chair. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And not your first trip here either, which is also great. <laughs> what is this? Number three for you, I think you've three been Three in the studio and yeah. 23 in Toronto, probably. Fantastic. That's great. Uh -huh. I want to start by going back in time. This is you at age 26. You have a long layover flight in Tokyo. <laughs> yes. And reflecting on that time, here's what you write. It was in autumn that I first got upended by Japan and realized that not to live here would be to commit myself to a kind of exile for life. What happened on that layover? <laughs> I was flying uh, from Hong Kong back to my home in New York City. The last thing I wanted was layover um, for 20 hours near Tokyo. <clears throat> I, to kill the time, walked around the little airport town, knowing that airport towns are not usually a center of fascination and beauty. I found myself in a garden of a thousand-year-old temple. It was a late October day, brilliantly blue, but the first pinch of cold and coming dark. Little kids, kindergartners, picking up acorns. And something went through me, and I thought, I know this place. I know it better than the street on which I grew up in England. I know it better than the apartment where I live in New York City. This place um, is my place. And if I don't follow this conversation, I will end my life thinking I've never lived. And there's something will always be unresolved. And I think we all have these secret homes, but I was lucky to stumble upon one relatively early. <clears throat> and by the time I boarded the plane, an hour later, I decided to leave my comfortable seeming job at Time Magazine in Midtown Manhattan and move to the back streets of Kyoto. And I've been there 32 years now and never regretted it. D did you not find that somewhat bizarre, given that you are obviously, as a writer, a man of words, <laughs> and you didn't understand any of the words that were being said in that place. I thought it'd be a liberation and an interesting mm. challenge and a good compliment to living um, four blocks from Times Square or working four blocks from Times Square, which is all words, all cacophony, all stimulation. And mm. Kyoto, Japan, though it's a big bustling city, as you say, because I speak limited Japanese, was a place of serenity and contemplation and ancientness. So couldn't have been less like Midtown. Well, you did well. You fell in love with your now wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you wrote about it in your book of, uh, oh my gosh, how many years? It's like 32 years ago now. Exactly, yes. Okay, The Lady and the Monk. Do you see any through line between that book and this book, Autumn Light? The same through line uh, that exists for anybody between the age of, let's say, 28 and 60. Mm. And I knew you and I are contemporaries, and if I were talking to you 32 years ago, I would recognize the same Steve, mm. even though uh, the years may have changed just a little bit. Um, but I think that book was about a foreigner's excited discovery of a foreign country, a new person, a new way of living. After 30 years in Japan, uh, I don't have the excuse of being able to make easy discoveries. So there the challenge is finding the beauty and excitement in everyday life in a very anonymous suburb. It's the difference between a honeymoon and um, a marriage in its 30th year. Mm. And how do you find the electricity in a marriage 30 years old that you did on your honeymoon? And it's a an, it's an powerful challenge, but I think the rewards are even better because I trust more what I find after 30 years of marriage than in the giddy second day of a honeymoon. Isn't that fascinating? We, we have, I think it was 10 years ago when you were here at TVO that we talked about the fact that you're a guy who spends a lot of time in airports yes. and considers yourself in some respects, you know, a citizen of the world as opposed to of any particular country. Yes. You're now in Japan six months a year. Yes. I, is it truly home for you? It's home in the deepest sense. Uh, I live there by choice on a tourist visa to keep myself honest, to remind myself my neighbors who are very kind and polite to me probably wouldn't like me to be calling myself Japanese, mm. to remind myself there are lines that are very strictly drawn between outsider and insider there. But uh, I, when I speak, as you say, limited Japanese, I don't eat much Japanese food, I never wear Japanese clothes. But in the way that you will meet somebody, a stranger in a party, and feel that you connect with her better than with your oldest friends and family. I have that relationship with Japan. It hmm. felt like home before I'd ever seen it, really, and even more so after 30 years there. Are you accepted in Japan? <clears throat> accepted as a foreigner, accepted as somebody who's permanently outside 
the circle. And a kind of amusing, apparently harmless figure who plays my part in the national pantomime, as it were, of the bungling foreigner who can barely speak Japanese. And that's enough for you? It's enough. Uh, it's enough because one of the things I like about Japan is everybody has her role so perfectly assigned. Mm. And that's what allows the whole country to function, as you know, like a beautiful symphony. Each person plays her part impeccably, mm. and the result is a harmony greater than the sum of its parts. So I'm an outsider. I don't know how to play um, a note of music. I, I don't have a copy of that score. I can only <laughs> disturb this beautiful <laughs> harmony they've constructed over 1,400 years, so they keep me at a distance, and they should. And by keeping me at a distance, they function remarkably and inspiringly to me as an observer and an outsider. I, I know 30 years is only a blink of time in a 1,400-year-long <laughs> culture, but still, is there not a part of you that's a little bit ticked off that, you know, after several decades here, you know, can't they let me inside the tent just a little bit more? You don't feel that? They allow me inside the health club, which is even better, <laughs> and inside the ping-pong club. So one curious thing, you know, this is, as you said, a meditation on mm -hmm. time passing, children scattering, parents getting older, but at the heart is the ping-pong club, where yes. I am the lone foreigner in a group of 30. And if you can believe it, at my towering five foot seven, I'm taller than almost the rest of <laughs> everyone else there. Uh -huh. In my 50s, I was the youngest by several decades. And when my wife looks in on the ping-pong table, she realizes her hairless, hapless husband is a kind of Justin Bieber. I've become, <laughs> I've become a teen idol. But to speak to your question, my 29 Japanese friends in the ping-pong club very happy to have a sort of token foreigner as a mascot. And really mm. so loving and kind. I feel I know them better than my friends in California. Well, you mentioned mm. California. Let me pick up on that. Because you write, I think of my friends in the West mm. and despair of ever being able to convey the bounty of this life to them. They have their equivalents, but the details of mine would make no sense to them. You want to give it a shot? <laughs> <laughs> yes, what a seamless transition. So um, <laughs> we live in a rented two-room apartment for which we pay... 800 Canadian dollars a month, as if we were 22-year-old kids. This is my wife, myself, and formerly our two kids. We have no car, no bicycle, no TV, I understand, no media. And the result is every day lasts a 1,000 hours. And I think what we're all craving as our world accelerates is open space, margins in our life, time to do nothing, time to assess everything that's going on in our lives. <clears throat> so I wake up every morning, I spend five hours at my desk, I take two walks around the neighborhood. This is really when I get my best writing doing, done. Uh, I make a cup of tea. I go and read a book out in the sun for an hour. I go and play ping pong. I answer my emails from my bosses and friends across the ocean. And I still have six hours left to spend time with my wife. And I never have that luxury when I'm in Canada or California or surrounded by distraction. Now, that's interesting. Why not? Because I would think a Californian, with all of the Michigas in their life, would look at that situation and think, boy, that sounds very civilized. I could get into that. They don't, eh? They do, but I think many of my friends are too addicted to, for example, I've never used Sorry, a... I shouldn't have dropped a word of Yiddish in there on you. Mishigas. You know what Mishigas is? <laughs> I, I could infer what okay. it was. Craziness. Sorry. Yes. There we go. No, no. <laughs> um, so it's startling to many people. I, as a full-time writer and journalist, have never used a cell phone. And I think many of my friends in California would find it hard at this point to function mm -hmm. without one. So they might say, it sounds nice, but they would also say, I don't think I could manage living in the middle of nowhere, not speaking the language on a tourist mm -hmm. visa. It doesn't sound so seductive or irresistible. Well, that makes sense. I get that. <laughs> OK. Autumn in Japan. You find it very moving. How come? Yes, you were just talking or singing about autumn in Vermont. <laughs> and in of the course, green room earlier, yes. Yes, and southern Ontario, I know, has a beautiful autumn. Tis. But there's something about the mix of wistfulness and buoyancy in Japan, because the autumns are brilliant, cloudless blue skies, uh, as that first day in Narita Airport, but um, you can feel the coming of the dark. And underneath the blue are the scarlets and golds and the lemon yellows of the turning trees. And, of course, everywhere in the world sees autumn as a season to learn about impermanence. But I think mm. there's no society where impermanence sits at the heart of the culture, as Japan does. If you take <clears throat> its classic work, The Tale of Genji, the word impermanence comes up more than a thousand times. And they mm. sometimes say in Japan that life is a joyful participation in a world of sorrows. Mm. And I think in Japan, and especially autumn, it's all about seeing how joy and sorrow are inextricable. And of course, I would do that in Ontario or New England, but at the heart of Japan, I think Japan pretends 
that it's all about the cherry blossom, but its heart is the five-pointed, brilliant, tiny maple leaf of the Japanese maple. Uh, and they have this lovely word, monoganashi, the sadness of things, which is what makes us appreciate the beauty of right now, because things don't last, and we have to enjoy them while we can. Well, we can appreciate the maple leaf here, of course. Yes, a yes. different kind, not yes. as delicate as the Not Japanese. quite, yes. <laughs> it's on our flag, after all. Yes. Here again from your book. <clears throat> Autumn poses the question we all have to live with. How to hold on to the things we love, even though we know that we and they are dying. How to see the world as it is, yet find light within that truth. That's, there's a lot of profundity there. You want to elaborate a bit on that, please? I'm not sure I could say it better than I did. That's in, said very well, I have to in say. That book. But let, uh, some people may have seen some of those old Japanese movies from the 1950s, where it seems that nothing's happening, the camera is stationary, you hear the sound of a festival outside, and somebody is sobbing in the room next door. Mm. And I think we <clears throat> have a more binary way of seeing things. How can there something be happy and sad at the same time? And in Japan, which is a very grown-up culture, having been around for 1,400 years, they think precisely when something's happy, there's the sadness that it won't last. And precisely when something is sad, <clears throat> that's an invitation to enjoy the wonder all around mm. us. Uh, and I went to Japan to learn from that kind of wisdom. I think of it as sort of sage, it's like a grandfather culture. And so I, in my late 20s, thought, I've enjoyed learning from um, the excited kid that is New York City, but now, I, as I start to try to make a life of my own, I want to consult an elder. And so Japan is a wise, seasoned elder for me um, that is offering these difficult truths, but truths that get harder as we face, in my case, an 88-year-old mother, a 91-year-old mother-in-law, what do I do with that? And what do I do with the fact that my beloved wife is now in her 60s also? And um, who knows how long I'll have to hold on to her? You don't think you're in the autumn of your years, though, do you? <clears throat> well, empirically, I probably am. But I take delight in it. Um, and I think one of the things I love in the ping pong club, <laughs> most of my friends were in their 70s and 80s. Occasionally, a teenager will show up, and my eight-year-old friend will thrash the teenager. <laughs> which shows that decline doesn't move in a straight line and that right. we're gaining things as we get older, even athletically as well as mentally and spiritually. Hmm. So uh, to go back to your earlier question, my first book 32 years ago was about a springtime romance, discovering Japan in the spring of one's lifetime. And this book is about what are the blessings and graces autumn have, has that spring could not even guess at. And there are plenty. And of course, spring has beauties that autumn envies too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a scary moment in the book when you have to rush your wife to the hospital. <clears throat> can you tell us that story? I can. <clears throat> uh, I, collected a <clears throat> I collected her once from a yoga class. And the yoga teacher said, you better come and get your wife. She's not making any sense. And I thought, well, if she's Japanese, it's California. Something's getting lost in translation. Mm -hmm. So I went and collected her. She waved happily at me. I took her to the car. And she said, what happened? I said, they were worried about you. They thought there was a problem. We began driving. She said, what happened? I said, oh, you didn't hear me? Well, they were concerned about you. What happened? Hmm. And then I said, well, remember last week we were in Toronto and you went to Niagara Falls. Toronto? What happened? Suddenly I freaked out. It had, as if her whole mind got stuck. So I called my doctor's office. He was away. The assistant said, get her to an emergency room right away. This could be a stroke. You have one hour to act on this. So I did. <clears throat> Took her to the um, room, we waited, waited. She finally got to an emergency room doctor. He looked at her and he asked her some questions, what day of the week it is, what is, what is the year? And he turned to me and he said, she's speaking gibberish, which is very good news because she has global transient amnesia. It comes up for no reason, it lasts for 24 hours. She'll never remember this day for the rest of her life. Just be with her till tomorrow morning and then she will just resume. Um, life as normal, which is exactly what happened. Had you ever heard of that before? Never. No. For a global soul, as you were saying, global <laughs> transient amnesia seemed yeah. the ideal thing <laughs> to get. I mean, much too appropriate. And she has shown no signs of it. And, and he said, has she done anything strange today? And I said, he went, she went to a new yoga studio. And he looked very relieved. He said, that would do it. Maybe they put her in a position that sent the blood circulating through her brain and there was a brief short circuit of kinds. But for me, it was almost a dress rehearsal. It was a terrifying moment because I suddenly thought, she looks the same, she's healthy, she's right here, she can talk, but as if she doesn't know who I am and all our history has been erased. And I realised 
the terror of losing somebody you care about. And it was like a dress rehearsal and a prompt for me to think, well, what about if my wife of 32 years is no longer here? Or she's here, but I can't communicate with her. That's a frightening moment. Very, hmm. very. This book, of course, is an exploration of Japan, but the themes are all universal. Everyone you know, you love, will die. Yes. I mean, that is a fact. Is there something, though, about the Japanese approach to that fact that is different from how North Americans approach that fact that you find appealing? Very. Uh, in some sense, the dead never live. <laughs> the dead are still alive. They're hmm. constantly with us in Japan. It's as if they've moved to another country. But as soon as uh, my father-in-law died at 91, which is how I begin this book, my wife had to buy a very expensive Buddhist name to uh, protect him in the afterworld and an even more expensive gravestone. But every year, that gravestone is lined at certain points with lanterns mm -hmm. so that her father can come back and look in on his much-missed loved ones here on Earth for three days before returning to his new haunt in the heavens. And sometimes my friends will say to me, you live in Japan, it sounds like a very crowded country, 127 people, million people living in a small space. And as you probably know, it's not crowded in that sense because people are very quiet and self-contained. Even when you're on the Tokyo subway at rush hour, it doesn't feel crowded. But what does make it crowded is that the dead are never gone. And as far as my wife is concerned, every morning she wakes up, she heats some water for her father's favourite cup of tea. She sets it out for him six years after his death. He's right there. And she's still putting snacks out for him 72 months after he moved to the heavens. And the other thing that's unusual in Japan is that this has a soul. This book has a soul. This table has a soul. And my wife tells me that if in a moment of frustration she punches the table, her father would have said, you have to apologise. That table has a spirit as much as your brother, as your best friend. What did the table do to harm you? So what does make Japan very crowded is that everything is saturated with spirit and, and the dead have never disappeared. Now, I understand why she, who is of that yes. culture and country, believes that. Mm. Do you? I don't know if I believe it, but I feel those are the rules of Japan. And when I arrive in Toronto, I convert my US dollars into Canadian dollars. When I arrive in Japan, I think this is the governing doctrine. This is what has guided this wise country for 1400 years. I don't know if I believe it or don't believe it, but that's immaterial. I'm a guest in this country. I take off my shoes when I enter the room in Japan. Uh, I eat with chopsticks when I'm in Japan. And I honour the fact that everyone around me assumes that the dead are right here. I can't see them. When we oh. check into an old wooden hotel in Japan, my wife is very likely to sense ghosts and I am not. So I know the ghosts aren't speaking Japanese and I'm happily <laughs> immune. But I trust her when she says there are spirits all around us. <laughs> and, and I think one reason that I write at length about that is that so often in this country, when we think about Japan, we think about the high technology, the anime, the manga, the super zany, very contemporary, often westernised aspects. And they're all there on the surface. But essentially, I see Japan as a very old man in a Planet Hollywood T-shirt. His clothes <laughs> may look the same as in California or Ontario, but in, inside, all kinds of things are going on that, as you suggest, are, are strange to us, but therefore interesting to us. Mm. The fact, I think it's the things that we expect to be familiar in Japan that are most foreign. For example, you go to a baseball game in Japan, they have two and three counts, where we have three and two counts, <laughs> and if the score is level after 12 innings, the game is declared a tie. Sorry, tied, not... I mean, oh. we, we, you say level, we say tied. The games can end in a tie. Yes, which they can't in, they do in not the American in, League or the National League no, or in, in the Sky Dome. So <laughs> they take a North American pastime and make it something entirely Japanese. Um, and I think what's interesting to every visitor in Japan is that uh, it's still the most foreign country on Earth. It's most like mm. another planet. And the spirits are a more interesting aspect of that than just the robots who officiate on weddings and the yeah. other mad things we hear about. I love it that you still call it the Sky Dome. I do too. It hasn't been... <laughs> Sorry, it hasn't, I'm 20 years out of hasn't date. technically been called that in a very long time, but that was the best name for a stadium. <laughs> yes, They call yes. it the Rogers Center now. Oh, that's a big loss. <laughs> I'm yes, with you. Yes. I'm with you on that. Here we go, once again from the book. Why, I wonder, must I so often be running against time when I know that the only way to be happy is to make peace with the autumn and see it as a friend? 
Did you ever come up with a satisfactory answer to that question you've posed to yourself? I went to Japan to try to address that question. Mm -hmm. And most of all, to think reality is a friend, loss is a friend, Gr grief is a friend. There's no point punching against them or trying to keep the door close to them. Much more useful to see them as lifelong companions that I have to make my peace with. Mm -hmm. And I think I was coming to... My mother lives in California, so I go back and forth between California and Japan. And California, of course, is the ultimate home of possibility. Mm -hmm. Everyone's living in the future tense, all the things they dream of doing. And it's wonderful when you're a kid there and you want to come up with fresh possibilities and long horizons. But then <laughs> life makes a house call, as you and I have been talking about. And all those golden dreams don't help you. The only thing that helps you when suddenly your wife loses her mind through global transient amnesia or your father-in-law dies. The only thing that can help you is realizing this is reality and this is what I have to work with. Forget about the possibilities. Reality is the given that every one of us is dealing with. And Japan is a lot of, has a lot of wisdom about living with reality instead of living with endless summer and possibility. Mm. You quote Henry David Thoreau in the book, mm. the leaves, he says, teaches us how to die. Do you think truly accepting the fact that you are going to die can allow you to lead a better life? I think you and I prepare a lot when we're taking a driving test or when we're going on a first date, when we're going for a job interview. But the big test of all is death, so it probably makes sense for any human to prepare for it a little. Hmm. And I think that, as I say, makes us appreciate right now much more. We can't take things for granted. Today's a radiant day in Toronto. I want to make the most of it because it may be cloudy tomorrow. Uh, mm. I don't know when the next time I'll be in Toronto. It may be raining when I return. So enjoy this moment because you don't know how many moments you have. To, to go to the Thoreau quote, when I was a kid, I thought, well, a lot of life <coughs> is about learning how to die. Now, as you can tell, I'm thinking it's more about learning how to live with the death of everyone you care about that actually scarier than the fact of my dying is the fact of my wife dying perhaps before me. And then what do I do? Because I'm still alive, but my arm has been amputated or some deep part of me is gone. And that's a critical lesson. And I don't claim to have come up with the answers, but I do think these are good questions to address so that life doesn't catch you shorthanded and suddenly you're bereft. And it speaks to what you were asking about the Japanese response to death. I think many of us, say in California or probably Ontario, we lose somebody and we don't know how to get out our grief, what to do with our anger, <clears throat> our sense of loss. In Japan, they have very specific rites. As soon as the person is dead, within 24 hours, the Buddhist priest comes, he chants, you put out the favorite beer for the person who's still in the coffin, you celebrate her, and within 24 hours, she's just ash. Mm. And I think in that moment of confusion, it's very handy to have a clear set of <clears throat> things to do and to realize people have been doing that for 1,500 years. You're walking step by step with them. And at least in those initial moments of discombobulation, you have a flashlight leading you through the tunnel, which may make the light at the end of the tunnel that much mm. closer than if you're just caught by surprise. Those sentiments echo what I hear a lot from people who are in their 90s, which is <clears throat> that the, the process of having to bury so many friends so often that's hard. They should read this. There's a lot of wisdom in this. The Dalai Lama is a friend of yours. Can I say that? You know him. Yeah, I don't want to presume to call myself a friend, but I've known him for 44 years, and I travel across Japan with him every year. OK, by the, by the Facebook definition of what a <laughs> yes. friend is today, you guys are really great friends yes. then. Yes. What has he taught you about accepting autumn? I think of the Dalai Lama as a master, <clears throat> a master realist who is also the great incarnation and spokesman for hope. So, as you can tell, this book is really about how to bring the reality of death and oblivion and limitation together with the hope without which it's very hard to live. Mm. And um, one of the moments I describe in the book and one of the beautiful times I've shared with the Dalai Lama was when, right after the tsunami that laid waste <coughs> so much of Japan and took 18,500 lives, he felt he had to go up there on a pilgrimage to offer what he could. So, I and my wife went up with him. And the thing that so moved me is that hundreds of people were gathered along the side of the road. And he went up to them and he held them and he looked deep into their eyes and he blessed them and he gave them some inspiring words. But when he turned around, I saw he took off his glasses and he wiped away a tear himself. And I thought, well, that's wisdom. He knows how to say constructive, 
positive, inspiring things to people in a great state of bereavement. But he's also human enough to feel the sorrow of them himself. And in fact, later he went into a temple and he said, I can't imagine what you're going through, but one day when I was 24 years old, living in my hometown of Lhasa, I was suddenly told, you have to leave your homeland tonight and you probably will never come back. And you have no time to say goodbye to anyone. You can't take your little dog. You have to head over the highest mountains uh, on the planet to try to get to safety this evening within six hours. Mm. And he did, and he hasn't been back to Tibet in 60 years. So <clears throat> I think one of the things he was saying to them was, all of us deal with loss. That doesn't make me feel any less for you, but it does make me think what you have to do to honor the people you, you, who are gone is continue their projects, construct your community as your nation so heroically rebuilt itself after World War II. Uh, think about what you can erect now that will most offer delight to the people you're mourning. So don't look to the past, which you can't begin to change, but do look to right now, which you can fashion as strongly as you need. Hmm. Let's <clears throat> finish up on this. Japan, I th well, okay, I'm going to put this out there and then you knock it away if you okay. think I'm wrong. Yes. Japan is you could argue, is in the autumn of its life right now. Yes. Japan, yes. economic growth has been stagnant for decades. They sell, I gather, more diapers to the elderly than they do to babies. Yes. The population is shrinking, yes. it is aging. Do you think Japan is in some kind of autumn of its life cycle right now? It's a beautiful way to put it. And one <clears throat> reason I wrote this book was because we hear so much about the problem of demographic problem of Japan, such an aging population, the oldest population on earth. And I didn't, want <clears throat> I didn't want to cover that in just a journalistic way, but more a human way. How does it feel in a Japanese neighborhood seeing this play out around you? Economically, they've been stagnant for 25 years, as you say. But their answer to that is to offer their differentness to the world. I was saying earlier how it's the most foreign country of all the countries I've been in 45 years. And so, <clears throat> even as so much of its industries are stuck, Japan has realized we can invite the whole world to Japan and the whole world will be amazed at the fact that our culture is stuck in the 8th century and hasn't really changed and is therefore endlessly <clears throat> exotic and mysterious and itself. And so the number of international visitors has gone up from 5 million a year to 31 million in the space of just... Um, 15 years in the course of this century, and probably it'll hit 40 million next year. So the whole world is coming to Japan, and happily, the tourist industry is flourishing, even as all the other industries are suffering. And I think Japan's great problem, which would make it autumnal, is it's out of sync with the global economy. It's not on the same wavelength as Canada, the US, anywhere. Among, <coughs> among 30 countries in Asia, Japan ranks 29th in terms of English proficiency. It's lower than North Korea, lower than Cambodia and Nepal and Indonesia. And they're not crazy about immigrants either. They're not crazy about immigrants. Uh, I, I was just hearing yesterday, Toronto took in 40,000 Syrian refugees, Japan in a year, 27. A huge country, 27 in a whole year. So yes, on, in the geopolitical sphere, they're failing on every front by being so different and by not speaking the world's language. But not speaking the world's language makes them culturally endlessly fascinating to Canadians, foreign, Chinese, Americans, the world. So that's the way they're trying to keep up. And it's worked very well for a few years, and it will keep on working through the Tokyo Olympics next year. The question is, after the Olympics are gone, will they still be able to keep appealing to people and culturally sustain what in every other way is fading so fast. Well, I sure hope this is the spring of our relationship because I still want you to come back to this studio many, many more times. I'd hate to think this is the autumn of your appearances here on TVO. Uh, the book is called Autumn Light, Season of Fire and Farewells, and it has brought Pico Iyer to our studio uh, one more time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. It's always a real delight. Appreciate that. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.